Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Today, we welcome Dean David Schillinger. He is an internal medicine physician. We're going to talk about his book, Telltale Hearts, a public health doctor, his patients, and the power of story. Dean David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. So let's start by briefly sharing your story journey. I grew up in uh, Buffalo, New York, in a public housing project. My parents were immigrants, my father from Hungary, my mother from Chile, and they were fairly well educated and we were able to get out of the projects fairly soon. And my father was a general surgeon, so I was, you know, grew up around medicine, although not the kind of medicine that you think of normally being associated with storytelling and communication. But uh, I went to medical school at, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania and uh, uh, Philadelphia, where there was no public hospital. They had just torn down their public hospital a few years before I got there to build a whole bunch of NIH-funded buildings to do research. And I had the fortunate pleasure of doing a rotation at San Francisco General Hospital as a fourth-year medical student, which really transformed my career because I, as, as I say in the book, we used to say San Francisco General Hospital, it's as real as it gets. I mean, it really was the peak of the HIV epidemic and medical students were really in charge of the emergency room in many ways. And I got to have real intimate contact with patients and their stories and sort of fell in love with primary care at that time. And sort of the rest, the rest is outlined in the book, but it's really about connecting with patients around their stories and how that kind of connection can uncover hidden diagnoses and help you better manage uh, the patient's multiple conditions and how when you aggregate these stories, particularly from one public hospital, they tell a larger story of what's broken in our public health system and our, our social safety net system in America. Well, that certainly resonates with me. I an internal medicine physician myself. I trained in Boston at yeah. Boston Medical Center that used to be the Boston City Hospital. Of course. What is it about that public hospital scenario that appealed to you and, as you said, changed your, your career trajectory? What is it about practicing in that setting? I think a couple of things. First of all, it's one of the only places, you know, in contemporary American society where people of different classes, races, and ethnicities come together in one place for a common cause. When you think about how divided our society is, it's a very unique place. And it's also where, at least from a healthcare standpoint, it's where healthcare meets social reality. You know, in, in private institutions, you have people who are quite privileged often, and the realities of the difficulties in their lives are, are not as apparent as, as they are in a public hospital. So caring for patients in public hospitals is inherently complex. And I'm really drawn to complexity as an internist and find that uh, setting extremely inviting. And I think, but I think most importantly, I recall, and I don't know if this ever happened to you at, at Boston City, but on my last day as a medical student, as I was leaving the mission emergency room after a 13-hour shift, all of the graduating medical students received a letter from the mayor, who was the mayor, hmm. Mayor Art Agnos at the time, who whose life, whose own life had been saved after an assassination attempt at that hospital. And we received a letter thanking us for serving the people of the city and county of San Francisco. And you can imagine as a medical student, I, actually the hair still stands up on my arms just telling that story, you know, when, when, you're, when you're really an underappreciated medical student to, to get that kind of letter describing a kind of a public servant role, it's a very powerful message to receive as, as a medical student and as a practicing physician. So that, that really has, has kept me there. We have a joke at San Francisco General Hospital, which is either you stay there for three months or 33 years. And, you know, I'm in the latter category. So so you wrote your book, Tell the Hearts, A Public Health Doctor, His Patients, and the Power of Story. Now, before talking about the key messages of the book itself, what led you to want to write it in the first place? Yeah, well, I mean, these are sort of the greatest hits. I mean, I'm, you know, as an internist, you have patients who's, who's, um, care just sticks out in your mind for their uniqueness, for their 
salience and for sometimes for the surprise and epiphanies that come from them. And these just accrued over time. I've been working as a primary care doctor at San Francisco General Hospital now for over 30 years. And many of these stories, the first time they hit me were quite shocking. But by the 20th time I heard the same story, I was like, you know, there's there there's pa patterns going on here and what I call a narrative epidemiology of sorts. And that these stories need to be told to the general public because in the United States, we we cling to this idea of rugged individualism and that, you know, people's health is determined by the decisions that they make in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think the stories that I tell in Telltale Hearts share a common theme, which is that people's health and disease trajectory is determined primarily by the social and environmental conditions in which they find themselves born into and living. And that comprises 80% of health in America. And unless we begin to really change the discourse, not only around public health, but around healthcare itself, to understand the powerful role that social and environmental conditions play in people's health, we're just going to keep spending more and more money on technology and and kind of missing missing the boat. So, you know, it also was a creed occur for listening to patients and really enhancing physician well being by by understanding people's stories and where they come from and having shared connection. Can you tell us a story from the book that really highlights how that social and environmental factors directly affects that patient's care? Yeah, I mean there are there are numerous stories in there. I think the one that that many people find most compelling was a patient of mine, a, a fairly long-standing patient of mine with diabetes, a grandmother of five five kids and something like 12 grandchildren who was hospitalized on the medical service for profound hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. And you know, this happens from time to time in people with diabetes, they take too much medication or they don't eat they don't eat breakfast that day and you infuse them with some glucose and they turn around quickly and you send them home. But she was hospitalized for three, four days and they just could not, you know, for the life of them, get her blood glucose up. Yeah. And the usual medical workup ensued, you know, is it sepsis? Is it liver failure? Is it an insulinoma? You know, what, what could be going on? And they finally got the blood sugar up. They never really figured out what the cause was. And then I saw her in follow-up in clinic and I kind of went through my differential diagnosis of like, okay, are you food insecure, you know, and, and that you were basically feeding your family and uh, in lieu of feeding yourself while taking your insulin? No, no, I, I know, you know, I, I know how to stand in the lines at church and get the food that I need to get for the family. Uh, okay, are you, do you have limited health literacy or numeracy? You know, show me how you drew up your insulin that day. And she, you know, hit it right on on the mark. And, you know, every, every question I asked, she just answered, you know, perfectly. And I was, I was getting nowhere. And, and finally, I just said to her, well, look, you're, you're, you're the expert here. You know, what, what do you think yeah. happened here? And that's when she starts tearing up and telling me the story about her abusive husband, who essentially has been using her insulin as a weapon against her, either withholding it or administering it against her will as a form of power and control. And in her case, he, he injected long-acting insulin, probably just a massive amount of long-acting wow. insulin. And so, you know, the intervention was a restraining order and ultimately prosecution of, of, of the husband and liberating herself from an abusive relationship. And, you know, the prevalence of intimate partner violence in public hospital patients is quite, is quite high. So that's just one sort of dramatic example of of uncovering social conditions, in this case, at an interpersonal level, but many of the other cases are at a more social or structural level, be it housing problems or food insecurity or criminal justice system or what have you. So that really resonates in that, in what you said, patients are really the experts of their own body, right? And sometimes getting to share that story, that history can lead to the ultimate cause of, of, of really what's going on. And Unfortunately, today, as you know, you don't need me to tell you that there's just so many business aspects that really puts pressure on on patients sharing their story. Time is limited, you know, especially right. in primary care. We have like whatever fifteen minutes to see a patient that really condenses the time that patients 
are able to tell their story. So you've been practicing for 30 plus years and you've seen this business evolution and the infiltration of business into medicine. How can you continue that storytelling aspect in spite of all of these changes and all the time pressures and bureaucratic hassles that face you as an internal medicine physician? How can you really maintain that importance of story and, and that relationship despite everything else that's going on around us? Yeah, I mean, I have 20 minutes for a visit. I think the average primary care doctor across the country has now something like 17 minutes per visit. You know, I like to say it's, you got 20 minutes, you know, what are you going to do with it? It's up to you what you decide sure. to do with it. And also, as you know, being a, an internist, primary care, you have the luxury of seeing the patient back. And so I think the, 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 the most important policy problem we have to deal with apart from some of the within the encounter stressors that you describe is the paucity of primary care physicians in this country and the lack of policy solutions to ensure that we can have longitudinal care for for complex patients because it's over time that these stories unfold often you know some in the book some of the stories i tell happen on the first visit you know there's a, yeah. a woman with with breast pain that's undiagnosed and you know, the story unfolds in, in an urgent care visit, but the vast majority of these stories unfold over time when you see patients back and back again. You know, it, there is some research on listening. There's, you know, when you compare the research done on doctors talking to patients to how doctors listen to patients, I mean, they're, they're the former dwarfs the latter. There's not a lot of research on listening, but we do know that really trying hard to avoid the lecturing style, to give space on the order of 60 to 90 seconds to patients and to give silent pause time can exponentially increase the amount of storytelling that happens and lengthens the visit by, you guessed it, by about 60 seconds. So I think the strategic use of open time and very mindful, uh, question asking, where you mix kind of open-ended questions with semi-structured questions with direct questions in a mindful state is, is really key. I think it's when we're just kind of logging it in and not being really, you know, having that beginner's mind and true attentive state that we lose out on the possibility of eliciting the patient's story. But I, I am confident that we can still do this even in today's world. And I think Increasingly, with what we're learning about AI scribes, um, yeah. we may be finding that we can have some freed up time to elicit story. Who is the main audience for your book? And what is the main message that you want them to receive after reading your book? Uh, the main audience is the general public. Obviously, I think doctors, medical students, nurses are going to read it too because they they we all have our stories and it's fun to kind of read about our colleagues' experiences. But the main audience is the general public. And I think the main message is, the, is well, there are two. One that I sort of shared with you already around the way health happens in America really has to do with our social and environmental conditions. And unless we start engaging in social policy um, initiatives uh, and health policy initiatives at the public health level, um, we're going to become bankrupt uh, as uh, Medicare and Medicaid grows. Um, and so, you know, really getting people to think about health in all policies, you know, that sort of how the USDA makes policy is important for health care, how the Federal Trade Commission makes policy is important for health care. So in that regard, it's a policy book for, for folks who are interested in equity and policy. And then the second, I think, main message is that even across great degrees of social distance, as you find yourself in, and I'm sure you felt this at, at Boston City Hospital, whether you're dealing with a patient from across the globe or someone who's homeless, they're, they're different from you, but that ultimately, through the sharing of stories, we can share our humanity. And, you know, once you have shared humanity with another individual, you can't help but care for them. And I think that that's true in healthcare. And I think that that particularly in this divided society today is a message that we need to, you know, to remember 
for society as a whole, that, that we need to listen to each other's stories if we're going to be able to understand and care for each other. We're talking to Dean David Schillinger. He's an internal medicine physician. He's the author of the book, Telltale Hearts, a public health doctor, his patients, and the power of story. Dean David, we're going to end with some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Uh, additional take-home messages. I mean, I think curiosity. I think it's really important to be curious about the other and to not make assumptions. It's so easy to take shortcuts in medicine and in you know general civil society as a whole. But to be interested in you know the guy who's selling you food at the corner store and the woman who's bagging your shopping and just to have the kinds of conversations that you don't think possible can really enrich en enrich your life and give you greater faith in the resilience of, of humanity. And I think that the other main messages are places like public hospitals are, you know, few and far between, but are extremely valuable assets to society and ways in which we can address income inequality and other ills that we have in society and that we need to be very cautious about how we handle the future of these kinds of institutions. And lastly, a really a call out, a shout out for primary care as one of the main solutions to our healthcare crisis in America. The book is called Telltale Hearts, A Public Health Doctor, His Patients, and the Power of Story. Dean David, thank you so much for sharing your story, perspective, and insight. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you, Kevin, for having me. <laughs>